Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, president of City Club, and I welcome you all. Those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB radio and watching on cable television. We're glad you are with us for our program today on this Friday, the 18th of July, 2008. Our program today features a debate about the proposal for the construction of a liquefied natural gas, or LNG, import terminal at Bradward, Oregon, Bradwood, Oregon on the Columbia River and related aspects of Oregon's energy future. Before we begin our program, however, a few announcements. First, in consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, we ask that everyone in the room silence your cell phones and any other device that might make noise. Please know that next Friday, July 25th, our Friday Forum program will consist of a conversation with former Portland mayors Bud Clark and Vera Katz, who will bring their words of wisdom derived from their combined 20 years of experience serving as mayors of Oregon's largest city. Now this proves to be a unique program because of the two guests, uh, and it also will be our last Friday Forum for the summer as we take our traditional August break. So be sure to join us for next Friday's Forum with special guests Bud Clark and Vera Katz next week here at City Club. City Club has great partners in presenting these Friday Forums. In fact, these Friday Forums would not be possible without the generous support of our corporate sponsors. This quarter's Friday Forum corporate sponsors are West Coast Bank, the law firm of Stoll Reeves LLP, Neil Kelly Company, and City Center Parking. We thank them all for their support. Citizen Salons, as you all hopefully know, each summer City Club hosts Citizen Salon dinner discussion events, typically in club members' homes, featuring great food and great conversation on a pre-selected subject led by one or more special guest provocateurs. Some of our Citizen Salon sessions are sold out, but others are not, and we encourage everyone, whether you are a City Club member or not, and whether you're here or in our listening or viewing audience, to attend one of these memorable evenings of special food and conversation. The various citizen salons are described on the club's website uh, and in brochures available in the back of the room for those of you who are here today. And we want to make special mention of a new citizen salon that has been added, and it's actually not in the brochure, for Thursday, August 21st. Uh, club member uh, Joella Worland will be hosting a salon that evening in her home featuring Reed College President Colin Diver. Colin Diver will lead a thought-provoking discussion on how we can all better dialogue in our society about such culturally divisive topics as traditional marriage versus non-traditional marriage, creationism versus evolution, and other aspects of what might be called part of our culture war. Or it might be called part of the big sort, as our speaker last week, Bill Bishop, described it. So please consider this timely new Citizen Salon on, on uh, August 24th featuring the president of Reed College as well as other Citizen Salons during the remainder of the summer. For more information regarding these salons, uh, again, you can contact the website and reservations can be made by calling the City Club office. And remember that the price you pay to attend a Citizen Salon goes to help City Club. And now to our program. Today's program, as I said, will consist of a debate about the proposal to construct a new LNG. You all should know now that LNG is liquefied natural gas, or if you don't, you will by the end of this next hour. It's an LNG import terminal proposed for Bradwood on the Columbia River in Oregon and related aspects of Oregon's energy future. Now let me explain the format for our debate. We will have one debater who will advocate the case for the Bradwood LNG terminal and additional natural gas supply in Oregon generally. And we'll have another debater who will argue that the Bradwood LNG terminal and increasing fossil fuel energy supplies generally is the wrong strategic direction for this state. Now our two debaters will be introduced by our debate moderator who I, who I will introduce shortly. Our moderator will begin the discussion with an overview of LNG issues. Each debater will then make introductory comments of approximately five minutes. And after the introductory statements by our moderator and our two debaters, the moderator will then ask questions of the debaters who will be expected to answer each question in approximately 90 seconds. 
Then at one o'clock, we will proceed to a question from our board host, and then we'll end the session with a pro uh, question from City Club members from the floor, as always. Uh, and just so you know, City Club Research and Policy Director Tony Yaccarina will uh, serve as our timekeeper today. And Tony, if somebody's time uh, runs out, what will we hear? We'll hear a tinkle. Okay. Uh, he's, he's to keep our debaters and our moderator on schedule. Now, before I introduce our moderator, uh, in that we are having a debate today, and it's regarding a subject in which, on which some have very strong opinions, I want to remind us all that the mission of City Club, paraphrased, is really twofold. First is to inform our members and the community regarding public issues. So it's about information. And secondly, it's to mobilize our members and members of the community to become involved in those issues as citizens. So it's about involvement. And I mention this because we cannot achieve this twofold mission if we are not open to information and views and arguments that differ from our own predisposed personal opinions going in. So as such, I ask that everybody in the room remain courteous and respectful and open to all information conveyed and all views express, expressed during this and any other debate that we have, even if you disagree with what you're hearing. Because by doing this, you will help further the kind of civil discourse that City Club stands for and that all important public issues, including the one we're going to hear about today, deserve. And now to introduce our moderator. He's a reporter for the Daily News in Longview, Washington, who has covered the LNG issue since 2006. He has previously written for the Los Angeles Times and America Online, as well as for the publication Thompson Financial and the Times Herald Record in New York. He grew up in Corvallis and earned his journalism degree at the University of Oregon. He tells me he is married with two children, but that he and his family share their home with a frighteningly large but lovable Weimar runner. To introduce our two debaters and to serve as our debate moderator then, please welcome Tony Leister. Tony? Yes. I'd like to thank uh, Jim and the rest of City Club for having us here today. This is by far one of the most interesting debates I've had a chance to cover. And I've had some good discussions with Joe and Brent on this, often on rapid fire deadline. So it's fun to have a chance to, uh, to talk about some of these issues in a more relaxed setting. Um, to introduce uh, uh, Joe to start, uh, in November 2006, uh, Joe was uh, appointed Senior Vice President of External Affairs for, the Northern, for Northern Star Natural Gas, which is developing an LNG terminal in Oregon and an offshore LNG terminal in California. Mr. Desmond is also, also currently serves on the advisory board for Stanford University's Pre-Court Institute for Energy Efficiency. Prior to joining Northern Star, Desmond served at, in the Schwarzenegger administration as chairman of the California Energy Commission and under secretary for energy affairs in the California Resources Agency. Brent Foster is the executive director for Columbia Riverkeeper a river conservation group that works to protect and restore the Columbia River. Brent has worked as an environmental attorney that focuses on citizen enforcement of the Federal Clean Air Act and related state laws since 1999. Columbia Riverkeeper has been actively involved with a coalition of groups opposing the two liquefied natural gas projects proposed for the Columbia River for the last two years. I'd like to take a moment just to frame up this debate. The, uh, the liquefied natural gas debate, of course, is part of a larger discussion of how we'll get our energy in the decades to come. It's a discussion we'll be having more and more as we consider questions of climate change, preserving our environmental assets, maintaining our standard of living amid increasing energy costs, and as we rethink our relationships with foreign governments and the role fossil fuels play in those relationships. Here, in a nutshell, is what Northern Star Natural Gas wants to do on the Columbia River. It plans to build an LNG import terminal 38 miles from the river's mouth at an old mill site called Bradwood. Gas exporters overseas would freeze their gas into a liquid form, which makes the gas denser so that more of it can fit on a carrier and it can be shipped more economically. 
LNG carriers, each carrying more than $20 million in cargo, would travel up the Columbia to Northern Star's terminal. The gas would be pumped into two large tanks on the shore, each 168 feet high. It would then be warmed back into a gaseous state and sent to market through at least one new pipeline, one of which would cross Clatsop and Columbia counties in Oregon and Cowlitz County in Washington. These facilities so far are pretty rare in the U.S. There are six onshore LNG facilities in the U.S., but more are coming. Regulators have approved 20 new facilities in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and an additional 13, including Bradwood Landing, have been proposed. Three are proposed for Oregon alone, and Northern Star is the furthest along of the Oregon terminals in that application process. So what, what does all of this mean? When you discuss the LNG debate in the Northwest, I think there are five ideas you want to keep your eye on. One is safety and security. This is an awful lot of fuel moving and being stored along a narrow river channel. The tankers are escorted by a strict security detail, often provided by the Coast Guard. Surrounding vessels are regulated by a security buffer, sort of like a no-fly zone that moves with the ship. There are worries that the carriers could run aground or that the shore bay storage tanks could be breached. Another is the question of commerce and lifestyle on the river. The Coast Guard isn't saying much yet about how this buffer zone surrounding the LNG carriers and the facility will be enforced. And there are only certain places on the river where other shipping vessels will be allowed to pass LNG carriers. Ports along the river are worried this will slow down incoming and outgoing ships and that if the delays are too long, their business will go elsewhere. And then there are the landowners who would have to surrender a portion of their properties through eminent domain to accommodate the pipeline. They're worried about safety issues as well as their property rights. There's also a complex regulatory structure and a fight over, for power between the Federal Energy Regular, Regulatory Commission and local jurisdictions. The Energy Policy Act of 2005 took the power to approve LNG terminals away from the states and handed it to FERC. Oregon Governor Ted Kulangoski has been leaning on FERC to take into account the state's concerns, and Senator Ron Wyden has introduced a bill supported by Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, Joe Lieberman, and Chris Dodd to restore that power to the states. Meanwhile, Oregon is left to consider the terminal certifications under the Coastal Zone Management Act and to issue air and water quality permits. It's unclear where the state's going to go with those permits or what happens if the state ends up at odds with FERC. There are also questions of the environment. Northern Star has pledged to spend nearly $60 million over the life of the project for salmon recovery efforts, but the company is going to dredge a turning basin in the river for the LNG carriers. There are questions of emissions from the regasification process, and some worry that the ballast system the carriers will use when they're at port will kill juvenile salmon. And lastly, and quite significantly, there's a vigorous debate about the role LNG will play in Oregon's energy market. Do we need this gas? Can it be better supplied by pipelines? Will LNG really keep prices down? And will the gas simply be shipped to California? Northern Star says the vast majority of the gas that comes through its terminal will stay in the Northwest. It also says that the Northwest current gas supplies, which come largely from Canada and the Rockies, are headed east through a new pipeline, and that LNG is the best way to replace those lost supplies. Skeptics aren't so sure. So that, is the LNG debate in a nutshell. And now I'll hand it over to Joe and Brent. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to be here today. The subject of energy is an important issue that deserves more than just an exchange of sound bites, so I really appreciate the forum City Club provides. Before I talk about LNG and the Bradwood Landing Project, I want to take a step back and put this in context. Sound energy policy requires striking a balance between affordability reliability, and environmental stewardship. That's the challenge we face. Consider how Oregon generates its power today. Hydroelectric dams provide 42%. Coal accounts for 41%. Natural gas is 10. Renewables deliver 4. Nuclear provides 3. That's right. Renewable resources today account for only 4% of the energy used to power your homes and businesses. Looking to the future, nuclear is not a realistic option. No one is constructing new coal plants, or for that matter, proposing new hydroelectric dams. In fact, it is the move away from coal and its global warming emissions that is driving the demand for gas-fired generation. 
Regionally, that demand is forecast to grow 2% each year through 2025. There is no one silver bullet for meeting Oregon's future clean energy needs, but natural gas is certainly needed in the transition to greater use of renewable energy, and that transition will take decades. Today, Oregon imports 100% of the gas it consumes. Two-thirds of that gas comes from Canada, and increasingly, Canada is using more of its gas for its own growing demand. The remaining third comes from the Rocky Mountain region. Now Oregon faces new competition for Rocky's gas as new pipelines divert that gas east to higher priced markets. The bottom line is that Oregon will benefit from new access to, uh, from access to new sources of clean burning natural gas. Oregon families and businesses are already being squeezed by high fuel costs and food costs and just this week we saw that natural gas rates could rise by as much as 40 percent this fall. That's a wake-up call. High prices reduce disposable income, increase cost to business, and impact those who can least afford it. LNG is simply natural gas cooled to minus 260 degrees to make transportation easier and cheaper. As a liquid, it cannot burn. What's more, LNG is not stored or transported under pressure and cannot explode, period. You might be surprised to learn that LNG is not new to Oregon. There are two LNG facilities here one in Newport and one in Portland that have operated reliably, quietly, and without incident for almost 40 years. Domestically, Alaska has been exporting LNG to Asia for nearly 30 years. Our terminal and its 38-mile pipeline would be located at Bradwood, east of Astoria. The location has a 150-year history as an industrial site and deep water port. Building an LNG terminal in the Northwest would promote supply diversity and reliability. Competition from new supplies would help lower prices for families and businesses. It would also result in lower shipping costs by hundreds of millions of dollars compared to a new domestic pipeline, helping to preserve the region's historic low-cost energy advantage. Northwest employers such as pulp and paper mills, food processors, aerospace firms, and other manufacturers depend on access to affordable, reliable, stable energy supplies to compete and grow in a global economy. During its three-year construction, our project would generate two million hours of work for skilled union workers, peaking at 450 jobs. When completed, Bradwood will become by far Clatsop County's largest taxpayer, providing $8 million a year in new revenue for county services, and once operational, would employ 65 people a year at an average wage of $60,000. Not a single dime of taxpayer or ratepayer money will be used for the project. Our project has been designed to ensure a significant and sustained net environmental benefit to the Columbia River. For example, we have committed $59 million as part of a salmon enhancement initiative to improve ecosystem function and salmon productivity. Using the federal agency's own models, our actions are projected to improve survival by 1.77 million more juvenile fish each year. We've also committed to provide screened water for ships to avoid harming fish, the first time any ship would make use of screened water on the river. Nearly six years has passed since we began our development efforts. FERC will soon make a decision on our project, but it is not the end. The state of Oregon still has a significant role to play. Any decision by FERC to approve our project will require that we satisfy all applicable state and federal standards before we could break ground. This conversation today really is about Oregon's quality of life. As the Oregonian concluded earlier this week, LNG can be one tool to help America meet its responsibility to reduce emissions of climate changing gases. The Bradwood Project should be allowed to move ahead. I hope you agree. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here, and thank you to City Club for the invitation. Thank you to Tony for keeping us in check. Any discussion about LNG ports and the high impact pipeline infrastructure that goes along with them has to start with the recognition that LNG is a foreign fossil fuel. It is inherently foreign. There's no domestic LNG that would be arriving at Oregon shores. Right now, the Northwest gets all of our gas from either domestic or Canadian sources. The push for three new LNG terminals in Oregon would change that. And for the first time, make Oregon, Washington, and California dependent on the same Middle East, Russia, Russian, and other major LNG exporters that we currently 
depend on for the gas we put in our car. But with LNG, we would become dependent on these foreign suppliers for the gas we put in our homes. Any of the three LNG projects would import roughly twice the amount of gas that Oregon even uses and are really driven by the need to get gas supplies to California, where every LNG terminal that's been proposed to date has been denied. While they're looking to Oregon and Washington as something of a backdoor to California, and this is certainly highlighted by the fact that there will be Northwest Naturals proposing a 220 mile pipeline that would go right from the LNG terminal, right across Mount Hood through the Willamette Valley and crossing 300 streams that would connect that LNG terminal to the California-bound Trans-Canada Pipeline. It is a one-way pipeline, and I can tell you Northwest Natural is not looking at spending close to a billion dollars on that pipeline so that the LNG can stay in Oregon. Some historical context in considering LNG is helpful. In the 1970s, in the face of high energy prices, there were some who said we should shift our energy focus to homegrown energy supplies, renewables, efficiency, conservation. People like Jimmy Carter even donned himself a sweater and said that Americans should turn down their thermostat and take simple steps to reduce their energy supplies. But he was laughed at by people who persuasively argued that instead we should go look for more foreign supplies of fossil fuels. And that's exactly what we did. And as a result, as, uh, I, I never thought I would be, be on the same page as uh, uh, T. Boone Pickens, uh, but both of us see that spending $700 billion a year to the Mideast oil kingdoms does not make a lot of sense just to continue our addiction to fossil fuel. For some context, that's roughly $80 million by the time we finish here today. Secondly, global warming is a global environmental crisis it's from melting glaciers, increasing storm and drought intensities, having a broad range of other catastrophic effects thanks to our addiction uh, to foreign fossil fuels. Three, We've spent the last five years and roughly half a trillion dollars in, on a Middle East war. It is difficult to imagine we would be fighting were it not for the fact that the Middle East is what we depend on for a large supply of our foreign oil. We were at a crossroads in the 1970s and the energy companies put us on a path. Today, we see the LNG promoters asking us to follow that same path again. Don't look inward, we can't do it. Lots of reasons why. We need to look at foreign energy sources as the alternative. It's nice to talk about LNG potentially coming from Australia or other places like that, but as Oregon Department of Energy concluded when they said, not us, when Oregon Department of Energy analyzed this and said, Oregon doesn't need LNG, they made clear that Oregon LNG would be coming most likely from the Middle East. Iran sits on the world's largest natural gas reserves, so in many ways, I see the decision regarding LNG as, as having a lot of relevance to where we are going to be faced with potential future conflicts or other wars in the years to come. The lack of LNG, need for LNG in Oregon was highlighted as, as I mentioned by Oregon Department of Energy for several reasons. First, LNG is twice the price of domestic gas. Don't believe me, go uh, 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 Google the Wall Street Journal had an article, the New York Times had an article, it was in the Oregonian. L, I mean, looking to LNG to help solve in, uh, 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 increasing natural gas prices it does not make any sense. That's why LNG imports are down significantly this year throughout the country. That's why the one newest LNG terminal that was the Chenier LNG in Texas is on the verge of bankruptcy, because they can't get LNG cheap enough to sell it in the United States and compete with domestic gas. There's higher greenhouse gases, roughly 30% higher if you believe Carnegie Mellon's study. Uh, than domestic gas. And in fact, Oregon Department of Energy said if, if you assume that we're going to have carbon sequestration, then LNG, electricity from LNG would actually produce 40% greater greenhouse gases, assuming you sequester both a coal plant and an LNG-fired electrical plant, LNG would have 40% higher greenhouse gas impacts than coal, if it's all sequestered. And that's because when coal burns, that's where most of the carbon gets released. You can capture it with sequestration. With LNG, it's the liquefaction, it's the cooling, it's the shipping long distances. Impacts on salmon of this project would be massive. And that's been highlighted by both federal and state agencies. In fact, every federal or state agency that's looked at it has said that the proposed mitigation will not offset the impacts that it would have. The Columbia estuary is really the linchpin 
for salmon recovery. If we want to recover it, we can do whatever we want with the dams. But unless you protect the estuary, we won't have salmon in 20 years. This particular project is proposed at the head of Clifton Channel. The site which is known, is that five or six? <laughs> I'll wrap up by there and address the impacts to communities uh, from the pipeline and project that I'm sure will come up in questions. First question, um, I'll address this to both of you. We'll start with Joe. Uh, there are many LNG facilities around the world, and I was wondering if you could talk about their safety record, uh, the worst disasters to date. And if, if you could, if you had time, you mentioned that LNG can't explode. I was wondering if you both could address what happens as it warms and revaporizes. First, let me come back to something you ask about LNG around the globe uh, in energy. Last time I checked, Canada was still a foreign country. i just point that out. Um, the LNG industry has a tremendous safety record. In fact, I want to say there have been more than 40,000 cargo shipped around the globe covering more than 100 million nautical miles without a single loss of cargo. Other than an early incident that occurred, and I'll talk about here, in 1944, there has never been a member of the general public harmed by LNG. In fact, the two things we do know about is in 1944, a wartime shortage of nickel, which is 9% used in the steel mix as a cryogenic material, was not there. And as a result, we had a tragic accident in Chicago. But since that time, standards and procedures have been put in place the same way all technology and safety has advanced around the globe. Recently in Algiers, they had an injury that did kill 28 workers, unfortunate. But that injury was based on a boiler room operation in a liquefaction, not receiving terminal. And it was based on the faulty design or design and technology not even allowed in the United States. Otherwise, it has a stellar record around the globe. After 9-11, the thought that we need to look at low probability, high magnitude events and consider what they would look like is obvious. And with LNG and the LNG tankers that come in, that, that, that's exactly what we're talking about. I don't think anybody is saying that if LNG tankers come in or LNG came in, we're absolutely going to have an explosion or there's going to be some accident. There'll be massive safety precautions all around that, and that will have serious effects from shipping to recreational commercial fishing use on the lower Columbia River. Uh, but nobody can say an accident's likely to happen, and I won't either. What I will tell you, though, is that Sandia National Labs, when they looked at the potential impacts of an LNG accident, somebody standing on the edge of the Columbia River with a shoulder launch missile and shoot it in the side of the, uh, an LNG tanker, what they found is that the blast zone, the high impact fire zone, would be about a mile and a half. That means the story gets wiped off the map. Now, if that's something that we could accept and say, well, it's just not very likely to happen, then sending an LNG tanker 38 miles up a narrow river channel makes sense. But with new proposals all around the country planned on doing LNG 25, 15 miles off or 15 miles offshore, the idea that we have to take one 38 miles up the Columbia River has the people that we work with around the country saying, gee, we thought our site was bad, but we can't believe what's being proposed in Oregon. And, and so for us, it's really, it's not for sure it's going to happen, but what are the impacts of that risk? How, what are the effects on a daily basis? And to us, that is enough to say one of the reasons this doesn't make sense for this location uh, is because of the safety, potential safety effects. The follow up on that, what, what happens if an LNG carrier runs aground or splits open like the Exxon Valdez? We'll start with you, Joe. Sure. Let, let's first talk about the construction of LNG carriers. There are some of the safest uh, vessels that operate in the high seas today. They have double hulled construction. And then on, that is six feet thick in thickness across. In addition, the containment cells or the containment sections themselves also serve as another barrier. But from a procedure standpoint, those tankers are boarded seven miles off the coast of Oregon by experienced bar pilots. They are also accompanied by Coast Guard vessels for safety purposes. Once across the bar, they are met by two tugs, one in the front and one in the back, each capable of stopping that ship, if under, under any circumstances there might be a loss of propulsion or control power. They move up the river the same way other carriers move today. You also have to remember that the draft is approximately 38 feet and the channel is dredged down to about 42 feet. It's also made of sand. There has never been in the history of LNG transport a cargo containment failure. But also, getting back to the notion, if there's a spill, for whatever reason, it evaporates because it's lighter than air and leaves no residue. 
But the notion of explosion, as I said before, is simply not possible. It's not stored under pressure. You cannot release all the energy simultaneously. And if we really think we have problems with 22-year-olds sitting on porches firing RPGs, then we have another issue to discuss. Keep in mind, there are far more dangerous and volatile cargoes that move up and down the Columbia River every day. Gasoline, ammonia, nitrate, none of which necessarily accrue or, or, or carry with it the same procedures, although the LPG carriers that move already have those escorts. So need to be not just about what is possible, but what is probable. You want, you want to restate the question there? Sure. Just, what I'm happens so if... engrossed in Joe's answer that I... <laughs> What happens if an LNG carrier runs aground and splits open like the Exxon Valdez? Well, let me tell you, the first thing that happens is that commerce on the Columbia River comes to a screeching halt. And that's going to happen if there's a little bump. I mean, a regular carrier goes up on, on the ground. And what you're looking at is when just the Port of Portland alone is putting out, generating over $4 billion worth of economic impact uh, in, in the state of Oregon, you understand why a number of the ports are concerned. Not just about one or two tankers coming up a month, but the plan for the Bradwood terminal is two to three tankers a week. With a 24-hour turnaround time, that means there'll be an LNG tanker in the lower Columbia River at virtually every time. That's very different. Yes, there are some high-risk loads coming up the river, but they don't happen every day. And the lower Columbia River, just to give you an idea, to make it even, what the Coast Guard has said, if we're going to do LNG on the lower Columbia River, just to man the, the cameras and night camera system, it's going to take a staff of 21 people. That gives you some indication that what we would be doing here is sacrificing the lower Columbia as a high security, uh, extremely high security, basically militarized zone. Uh, government accountability report just came out this year. It said LNG, most LNG tankers were 20 years old. They're 30 years old. They were made back in the 70s. Big concerns now over what happens to their insulation. Does it catch fire? Does it ignite? This is a brand new problem that Government Accountability Office has just been reporting and they said, as a result, we think that our current risk estimates underestimate what would happen in the event of a leak, in the event of a breach. That really just highlights that as of right now, we don't know what the effects would be of a spill. Here's one for you, Joe. Uh, Building Northern Star's pipeline means taking control of people's private property through eminent domain. We're essentially using government power to hand a portion of people's land over a, to a private company. How do you justify that from a public policy perspective or even a moral perspective? Tony, I actually think that's a question best put to the Supreme Court and Congress. Eminent domain exists for a real purpose. In order to ensure that projects can be constructed with the impacts and the benefits of those accrue to all members of the general public. It's true for whether it's highways, other pipelines, water, sewer, other lines. But let, let's be serious about what this project means. 38 miles over mostly private land, over a very narrow distance. Almost always you can reach an accommodation with a landowner regarding um, access to that property to construct a pipeline. Uh, the notion of exercising eminent domain is rarely, if ever, invoked. But it's there to serve a purpose, and that is to serve the public's general need in order to build the necessary infrastructure that serves all of us and keeps the economy running. Brent. I'd address this from two perspectives. One. The reason eminent domain doesn't usually get used is because it's uh, you're asking a, farm, uh, a farmer or a landowner or a forester to essentially negotiate with a gun at their head. And that gun's called eminent domain. And I can tell you as an environmentalist, I've become much more aware of what this means when you go talk to an organic farmer who's staring at a pipeline that would basically cut her farm in two, would ruin her, her growth season, would make it impossible. Uh, we, everybody from foresters who, who, who met with a woman uh, just last week who spent 60 years replanting trees to try to get this up. And now a private company is going to come in. This is not for the benefit of Oregon. Again, if, 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 if we could somehow use 1.5 billion cubic feet of gas, even though our current gas use is only about 0.6 billion, about half that, then there might be some argument. This is for Oregon. Everybody should just take one for the team. But what this is about is using Oregon as the back door to send this gas to California, because the Californians won't allow it. They've said for global warming and other reasons. Shoot, Tijuana wouldn't allow it. Yeah, and, and as a, a hotel owner uh, uh, in, in Astoria said, he said, I wasn't too concerned about this until I heard Tijuana chase the LNG terminal out of Tijuana and made him build one 60 miles south. Uh, that, I think, highlights 
you know, with eminent domain, this is something where it's really brought a diverse group of people together from Northwest Property Rights Coalition, Thousand Friends, uh, to Sierra Club and Columbia Riverkeeper, uh, and Cowlitz County Republican Party. You know, this, this is a real issue. This one's for you, Brent. LNG is being stored in LNG, or in, in tanks, uh, presumably as we speak, along the Willamette River, pretty close to downtown Portland. The tanks have been there for years with, as far as I know, no accidents. How is that different from the facility Northern Star wants to build in a rural area? It, it, it's hugely different in a couple ways. And first of all, what the LNG, the couple LNG facilities that are there today are called basically peak shaving facilities. We take domestic natural gas from the pipeline, you cool it, you store it until there's a big need, and then you release it. Uh, I'll be honest, if I lived around that LNG terminal and I knew that if somebody wanted to cause some problems, that is a, that is a, that is a site that could cause some significant problems. I, I'm not going to avoid that. It doesn't mean, though, that because it has existed, just like the World Trade Center stood and just like a number of other facilities have stood for a long time without problems until something happens, that we should go balance on the backs of rural Oregonians a, a proposal that is meant for California and basically are asking Oregonians to take the risks. The people who live on Puget Island right across from here would be a stone's throw from these LNG tanks. They'd be a stone's, uh, Astoria would be less than a few hundred feet from these LNG tankers that carry a 3,000 foot buffer zone, 1,500 feet on either side. W the Columbia's too narrow. We can't even do the minimum required buffer size because the, narrow is so, uh, the river is so narrow. Joe? Yeah, well, first, uh, he makes an interesting point. But the point is, they're twice as complicated as what we're proposing. It involves liquefaction, and then it involves rewarming. All we're proposing is a regasification terminal on the Columbia River at the Bridewood site. Um, but there's a second issue here when we talk about that, the notion of the carriers moving that, uh, that Brent raises. It's a 500-yard moving security safety zone. It's for the safety not of the ship, but of those around it. And as the Coast Guard has done after extensive studies, has said, we routinely expect vessels to pass in and out of. It's a set of protocols. It's not an exclusion zone. It's not a danger zone. It's a safety security zone that allows ships to pass, and they've identified exactly where that is. There is no risk, as he said, of this so-called worst case scenario. Uh, but those terminals exist, uh, excuse me, the liquefaction peaking facilities exist, as, as the best evidence I can point to that there is no problem, that these industries have a very safe record. But as for California, yeah, I work for the governor, and I can tell you he did not say no to LNG. What he said no was to a specific project. The notion that you had two proposals in Mexico and only one was built, I think is the lesson for here today. You have three proposals. Only one will be constructed because that's the requirement. But at 40% utilization, the amount of gas that would be provided for by our terminal represents 20% of the region's gas demand. So this notion that somehow this gas is going to California simply isn't true. The physical modeling of where the gas is consumed, even under the most conservative estimates, that gas remain 80 percent of that gas remains in the Northwest. Here's one for you, Joe. There's speculation that Northern Star will not build this terminal, but will instead sell its FERC license to another company. Can you guarantee that Northern Star will be the company we're dealing with five years from now? 10 years from now? If you guarantee me, Tony, you'll be the guy asking me these same questions. <laughs> the, the fact is, I, no one can predict the future, but, but here's what's relevant. All of the conditions that have been placed upon the project, whether through the land use process, through the FERC process, through review, are legally binding conditions that carry with the property. They have nothing to do with the company. The only people suggesting that somehow we might be interested in selling this are the project opponents, not Northern Star, certainly not the management and the employees, and certainly not the contractors. But the fact is, all of the conditions are legally binding for the duration of the project, regardless of what the ownership structure is. Well, Columbia Riverkeeper has been concerned about this because Northern Star's never built a gas station, let alone an LNG terminal. There is no safety record from this company. There's nothing to look to, that, nothing against Joe or the, the other people of Northern Star, but there, there's no record to look to to say this is a company that we can trust, this is a company we can expect to build a quality project. And when they turn around and sell it, we might get a company that has a long history it might be Mobile Exxon, who's willing to fight commercial fishermen to the death to save a small percentage of their year's profits. 
um, after they had their major release of oil in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in, in Alaska. And that highlights, I think that case highlighted, and it did to several people in Astoria, that what happens here, don't expect the Supreme Court or anybody else to ultimately hold the companies liable for what they do. They will enjoy the benefits of it. They want our water rights. They want Oregon. They want you to give up your right to about 15 billion gallons in Columbia water. They want state lands from the state of Oregon. They're not just saying, we want to do this all of ourselves, but they want to take private property via eminent domain, take state water, take state land, and in the profit, and in turn, make a profit selling gas that comes into Oregon to California. You can't bring in twice as much gas as Oregon uses or build your facility to allow that and then say this is just for Oregon. The, the, that, I mean, the governor described that as a quote unquote joke. Brent, if the gas doesn't come from LNG, where does it come from? Or do we shift to something different altogether? What's the realistic alternative for keeping energy prices low and keeping this economy alive and expanding? First off, we've got to get off gas. Gas, natural gas will certainly be a transition, and we're not going to have, no one's talking about turning off the spigot tomorrow. Uh, there are right now three proposals for billion cubic feet a day plus pipelines that would come in from the Rockies. Now, when, when this thing started, and, and, and Northern Star and the other LNG providers were saying, we're running out of gas, and we're sending new, we're going to send all the Rockies gas to the east, you could make that claim with a straight face. But with three proposals that have firm commitments for supply contracts to bring additional, basically double the amount of gas that Oregon's currently getting, there's not a straight faced argument, and this is exactly what Oregon Department of Energy said, there's not, we, if we need gas, we can get it from the Rockies or Canada, and it comes at a lower price, with lower greenhouse gas impacts, and with lower, lower uh, uh, carbon impacts. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, what, what I'm hearing is complete fiction and fantasy and represents a fundal misunderstand, fundamental misunderstanding of how the markets operate. First off, there are no companies out there talking about having firm commitments to deliver gas into the market. Those firm commitments don't tell, come until you expect, in fact, that the project is under construction or has uh, secured its necessary financing. Um, but an important point, we don't own the gas. The only way we can be successful as a business is by bringing in supplies equal to, willing to accept a price equal to or less than the prices being sold for in the market. No one has ever said the Rockies are running out of gas. What we have said from the beginning and others is that Oregon faces competition from those other markets willing to pay a higher price. The price of gas that sells today, today is approximately $11 per million BTU. This is high as 13 just a couple weeks ago. LNG costs four dollars and fifty cents, one-third what it's selling for today. The additional supplies that would be made available are what drives prices down and lowers cost. No one in Oregon or Washington or Idaho will ever pay a dime more than what that local price is going to be. Otherwise, the supply won't be there. And if we didn't think the supply wouldn't be there, we certainly wouldn't be investing millions of dollars in infrastructure. There is clearly a need. That need is based on the long-term view of the market. LNG has a role to play, and it can be delivered cost-effectively to provide an alternative with real benefits. As I said in my opening remarks, the transportation savings alone associated with those pipelines are run into the hundreds of millions of dollars. Joe, in... Oh, time's up. Yeah. <laughs> we could go all day. Thank you, gentlemen. It was a good debate. I appreciate it. Uh, the first question of our debaters is always will be from our Board of Governors hosts. Our Board of Hosts today is Tom Cox. Tom Cox is a Hillsborough resident and owner of a management consulting firm specializing in improving the productivity of technology teams. Tom was the Libertarian Party candidate for Governor of Oregon in 2002 and is now an active member of the Oregon Republican Party. Tom joined the City Club in 2003 and became a member of the Friday Forum Committee that plans these events. Uh, that year, he joined the Board of Governors this June. Tom? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, panelists and our moderator. Uh, this is aimed primarily at Brent. Uh, Oregon's energy future requires practical and balanced solutions, uh, yet Brent, your organization uh, represents a, a very clear focus on a very narrow agenda. 
And frankly, you would be achieving your agenda if my family were left cold, shivering in the dark, and the Columbia did not have an LNG plant on it. Uh, so where's the balance from your side? Well, first of all, I don't think we would be achieving our agenda if you were left cold and shivering in the dark. The conservation community has, I think, uh, a real reason to make sure that the lights still go on. The reality, though, is what we're talking about with the, North, with the Northwest Natural Gas Association has projected is a 1 to 2 percent increase in demand. Now, no one's talking about turning off the spigot, so we're not talking about having to come up overnight with some massive amount of gas. If we can't, through conservation, renewables, and the type of investment and efficiency that's warranted by global warming, the war in Iraq, and the billions of dollars we're spending to people who are sworn to kill us every year, if we can't muster one to two percent, then we deserve everything we're getting. And I think that if we focused on it, we'd be able to create local jobs, we'd be able to save money, efficiency will pay for itself. You know, when they retrofitted the San Francisco Convention Center with five million bucks, they saved about $800,000 a year. That's a 14% rate of return. That's good math, whether you're a, 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 a businessman or a conservationist. And that's where I think we need to say, hey, it's time for major investments, whether it's through bond measures, whether it's through uh, increased government rebates. We have to, we have to get serious. This is a, it's a national security issue, uh, and it's a, it's a social justice issue. And I think your family could do just fine and hopefully better uh, relying on conservation, renewables, and efficiency rather than LNG. Thank Okay, to keep, save time, if you could hold your applause till the end, I will now take questions from the floor. Asking questions at Friday Forums is a privilege of City Club membership. When you ask your question, please identify yourself, ask your question in 30 seconds or less, and please remember that a question actually involves a question, not just a speech. Uh, and if you don't finish in 30 seconds, you get uh, this, the threat of this question mark, which is the cue to the audience to give derision upon you, so you want to avoid that. Uh, and I invite the questioners to ask the question of any one member or two or three of the panel. Thank you. Uh, Fred Neal, uh, City Club member. Joe, I heard you say that only one LNG facility will be built in Oregon, that that is a requirement? No. Yeah, well, that's what I heard. And uh, my limited understanding uh, tells me that FERC has more of a Friedman-esque free market view of things, that the, if they'll permit any facility that meets their require licensing requirements, regardless of which state or local jurisdiction it's in. Can you help me understand where this concept sure. of the, we'll only get one comes yes, from? Yes, I can, easily. Um, when you look at these projects, FERC, and for that matter, so does the state of Oregon. In fact, Oregon's own statutes, when it comes to building new power plants, looks to the market to determine what projects do and don't get built. Capital markets are brutally efficient at determining what project. So when you look at the underlying demand, these projects have to be built and they rely on debt finance in order to fund the construction. That has to be backed by contracts that establish how that will be paid back over time. There is not enough demand to justify building three terminals and three new pipelines. The markets will determine. What FERC is saying is their job is not to pick winners and losers. It's to ensure uh, that they are meeting the requirements of safety and environmental standards, and then allow the market to determine what's the most efficient one. Quick example, we have a 38-mile pipeline. Our project might cost roughly, last estimate was $650 million. The pipeline that would come from the Rockies to Malin, which would serve California, not the Portland area, uh, has gone from $2 billion to $3 billion just in the last two months. So just to give you a sense, the markets will determine, I have to pay to move that gas. How am I going to get it there? What's it going to cost? So what I was saying is most likely is you'll only see one project capable of being financially supported. Um, Kurt Wavering, member. Um, <clears throat> So FERC has the uh, authority to, for primary siting authority, but the state does have permitting authority for local um, issues like wetlands and such. And I'm wondering, I guess my question is to what degree can the state assert its authority to block this project if it wanted to? You want to take it? Yeah, I, I'll take that. The state, is, the state has a huge amount of leverage here. For example, to issue the water rights for 15 billion gallons from the Columbia, 
Uh, the State Water Resource Department has to make a determination that this project is in the public interest. In the public interest. Oregon Department of Energy has already said, we don't need it. How can it be in the public interest? How can the state make that finding if they said that? Now, if Governor Kulangowski came out tomorrow or the Water Resource Department Director Phil Ward and said, we shouldn't issue this water right, and the State Lands Department made a similar finding, we should not give them the state lands to do the dredging they want to do for the turning basin, then you would see the investment behind this capital project evaporate almost immediately. Yes, there are Clean Air, Clean Water Act permits, but those water rights and those state land leases are the most discretional permits that the state of Oregon has. And while we really appreciate the great support the governor has given in terms of uh, uh, pressuring FERC and others have given, what we need are our state leaders to step up and say, no water rights, no state land, not for a project that the, uh, the, the state of Oregon has said we don't need. I just also want to add on to that question. First off, ODOE didn't say we don't need LNG. ODOE concluded, yes, the region needs natural gas. They may not think it can be as competitively priced as domestic, or they think there may be certain issues to address, but they did not conclude decisively it's not needed or LNG was not appropriate. So let's be clear on that. Secondly, water rights. 15 billion, whether it's 5 billion, 10, 15 billion, there are 1,800 carriers that go up and down that river each year that make use of water. Last time I checked, that water flowed from the mountains east, uh, excuse me, west into the ocean. It's two hours from being put into the ocean. You don't take water, you recycle it, you use it. You take it in, you put it out. And any water used for ballast goes exactly 200 miles offshore where it is put back into the ocean. So I just want to be clear on that. Thank you. Sir, my name is Edward A. Finkley. I'm the Executive Director of Energy Action NW, Energy Action Northwest. I've only been in the job one day. I used to um, belong to the city club. I've been practicing law for 20 some years and I got so lost in the weeds I quit coming to the meetings. Um, may I ask a question if I promise to join the group before I leave the room? Can we see your money? Oh. I have a credit card, sir. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. I have three questions. Brett, have you studied the maps? The price, it? Have you studied the maps between Portland and Opal and concluded from those studies that we can get gas from the Rockies with less impact on the environment? Our position is that we shouldn't be increasing the supply of gas at a time when we want to be decreasing our use of fossil fuels. It's like somebody going on a diet going up and, and going to Costco and, and filling their fridge with food and then saying, well, and, and this is to prepare for next week's diet. So we don't support any of the gas pipelines coming from the Rockies. They're, they're, they're going to have impacts. However, if Oregon needed it, they are a better option compared to LNG because it's domestic, it keeps the money within the United States, doesn't have the national security issues, and would have lower carbon impacts. And the follow-up on that, and, and you've studied the economic and the regulatory con and concluded that it's cheaper for the rate payers to come on interstate pipes from Wyoming rather than come by a free market by sea. It's the old one by land, two by sea thing like you, when you're in the military. What, what I can tell you is that with the price, and again, this is not me, this is Oregon Department of Energy saying that in order for LNG to be price competitive with domestic gas, the global price of oil would have to drop to $60 a barrel. That, I urge everybody to go read the Department of Energy report. There's plenty we don't agree with it in, like they say we ought to be looking at increasing gas supply, but there are some things that are very clear that simply reflects the, the current price of LNG. It's, uh, you know, we're competing with people like Japan who have no domestic supplies, and so they have no choice. They, uh, why would you put yourself into that sort of uh, market situation where you're competing against people who don't have choices? I, I, I Go ahead. Yeah, I need to respond to that. I want to come back to what I said. The ODA report only concluded that we would agree with the region needs gas. But I said before, it costs $404.50 to get it here. The price you're paying is $11. There's no reason that anybody would need to pay any more. That's not how things work in this. That fundamentally, it's about price less cost, and LNG is cost competitive. Doesn't make a difference what the price in Japan is, it's what the price in Oregon is. But as far as that price and the notion that we don't need it, two things in context. One, tell that to the hundreds of thousands of families that are facing a 40% rate increase here. What are you doing to increase supply to help lower my prices? 
That's what people should be talking about. The second is this notion of one or two percent is not a lot. I can tell you from California's perspective, even with a billion dollars a year invested in efficiency, net of power plant retirements, their peak demand grows average two percent per year. That means they have to add over a thousand megawatts of new power, new capacity each year. Two percent compounds, before you know it, in ten years, you have a pretty big gap. So there's no question you need to do more energy efficiency, you need to do renewables, but you also have access to, to, to gas in order to strike that balance between affordability, reliability, and environmental responsibility. Sir, I'm sorry, we have three people waiting behind you, and besides, I know you need to talk to our membership director. So, so can we go to the next person, please? Thank you. Well, that was a neat trick. I, I, I wish I'd thought of that, but I'm not a lawyer, so I guess I didn't. Chris Andre, City Club member. Thank you. I have a question for Joe. Robert Kennedy Jr. was recently in Portland speaking to the issue of LNG and Oregon's energy future, and he pointed out that there are many different types of um, LNG facilities and that the technology differs widely. He described some of these and he laid out clearly so that anyone could see the fact that what Northern Stars is uh, proposing here is by far aces away the cheapest, dirtiest, and consequently the one with the greatest potential danger. That's the type of facility that is being proposed. It's ancient technology Question. dating from an era when LNG did not have an absolute... Question. My question is, why, how did you determine, by what process did you determine this would be the appropriate technology for Oregon? Let me answer that by, since you cite Mr. Kennedy and his press conference, which also Brent Foster attended last week, just for the record, Mr. Kennedy wrote an editorial in the Ventura County News about uh, a year ago in support of LNG facilities. In fact, you're aware of that. He talks about it. But he also went on to say that he was concerned about the water, ballast taking water, because Exxon sent ships up the Hudson River where they stole the water and sold it to Aruba. That's crazy. It's, I, I, I can't even respond. So the whole notion of him offering up these criticisms without any evidence, we haven't seen anything in the paper. There's no details that he's provided. He simply made those statements, and I really can't respond to that. Oh, Our technology website. is as advanced as you can find in the industry, and it is designed to meet all of the requirements set forth by the state and federal agencies. I don't think he went, he didn't go into technological detail because it was, of course, a press conference, but I think that you'll find if you go to his website, it's all there in black and white. Thank you. Ted Gleichman, City Club member, and a question for our journalist guest from Washington, uh, since he's been ignored so far. My understanding of free market embodies the concept of a willing buyer and a willing seller. So if the organic farmer that uh, Brent cited is unable to resist eminent domain under the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission authority that would be granted to this private enterprise for this project, could you help us with a better terminology than free market, perhaps low-cost market, high-cost market, but certainly not free market? Thank you. Uh, could I add a clarification before Tony responds? Emin Domain is granted by Congress, not by FERC. And so this notion that FERC has some latitude here to address or modify changes to the rules regarding eminent domain has to be taken up by the courts and by Congress, not by FERC. I just want to clarify that. Go ahead. What I can tell you is that, is that the, the whole reason that, that the Daily News and Longview pretty much got into the LNG coverage game is because of a pipeline that Northern Star will run underneath the river and, and through Cowlitz County. It actually will connect up with the Williams Pipeline just north of Kelso near I-5. And that's, that's what drew our attention from the outset. We know, um, and I've written about a number of folks in Cowlitz County who uh, would accommodate this pipeline on their uh, uh, tree farms, uh, on their, their other properties. Some people have bought retirement areas there. And, um, and they're upset about it. Um, they don't want that pipeline there. Uh, it, 
remains to be seen, obviously, what kind of deals they can work out and, and what they, uh, whether they'll be satisfied at the end of the process. I'm sorry, we're out of time for further questions. Uh, I want to say that, uh, as we discussed earlier, civil discourse about important public issues like this one and others uh, to be addressed in the way we've addressed it today makes Oregon a better place. So I want to thank uh, Joe Desmond from North Star Natural Gas and Brent Foster from Columbia Riverkeeper, as well as our moderator, Tony Lystra, for making it happen. Uh, we'll see you next week for our last Friday Forum of the Summer with Mayors um, Clark and Katz, and we are adjourned. Let's thank our panel. <laughs>